The Dawn Flows Home to the Sea, Part 2, by Mikhail Sholokhov, Continued. Kushilyov and Chumakov carefully lifted him out of the saddle and laid him on the wet grass. Let's have a look at your leg. Now unbutton your trousers, Chumakov said, squatting down beside him. Stjeladnikov's leg was monstrously swollen. The skin was stretched tightly without a single wrinkle, and it filled all his ample trouser leg. Right up to his hip, the skin had gone a shiny, dark violet hue and was covered with spots velvety to the touch. Similar spots, only of a lighter tinge, had made their appearance on his swarthy, deeply sunken belly. A foul, putrescent stench came from the wound and from the brown blood dried on his trousers, and Chumakov held his nose, knitted his brows, and could hardly restrain the nausea which rose in his throat as he examined his friend's leg. Then he gazed closely at Stierladnikov's drooping blue eyelids, exchanged glances with Fomin, and said, It looks as though gangrene's set in. Yes, you're in a bad way, Vasily Stierladnikov. A quite hopeless case. Ah, Vasya, Vasya, what on earth did you do it for? Stierladnikov was breathing in hurried gasps and did not say a word. Fomin and Grigor dismounted as though at a command and approached the wounded man from the windward side. He lay still for a time, then supporting himself on his hands, sat up and looked at them all with filmy eyes stern in their resignation. Brothers, give me over to death. I'm no longer a living soul in this world. I'm completely worn out. I haven't got any more strength. He again lay down on his back and closed his eyes. Fomin and the others all knew that such a request might be granted, and they had been awaiting it. Winking briefly at Kashulyov, Fomin turned away. Kashulyov made no protest and snatched the rifle from his shoulder. Shoot! He rather guessed than he heard the words as he looked at the lips of Chumakov, who had stepped away. But Stierladnikov again opened his eyes and said firmly, Shoot here! He raised his hand and pointed with his finger to the bridge of his nose, so that the light goes out at once. If you happen to be in my village, tell the wife how it occurred. Tell her she's not to wait for me. Kashulyov seemed to fidget a suspiciously long time with the bolt of his rifle, and drooping his eyelids, Stierladnikov had time to add, I've only got the wife, no children. She bore one to me, but it was born dead, and there was nobody else. Twice, Kashulyov threw the rifle up and let it fall again, turning more and more pale. Chumakov furiously pushed him away with his shoulder and tore the weapon from his hands. If you can't do it, then don't take on the job, you whelp's blood, he shouted hoarsely, and took off his cap and stroked his hair. Hurry, Fomin demanded, putting one foot into the stirrup. Groping for the words he needed, Chumakov said slowly and quietly, Vasily, goodbye, and forgive me and all of us for the love of Christ. We'll meet again in the next world, and there they'll judge us. We'll tell your wife what you asked us. Chumakov waited for an answer, but Stierladnikov was silent, and his face paled as he awaited his death. Only his eyelashes, bleached by the sun, quivered as though fluttered by the wind, and the fingers of his left hand quietly stirred as for some reason he attempted to button up a broken button on his tunic. Many deaths had Grigor seen in his time, but he did not stop to watch the death of Stierladnikov. He hurriedly walked on, forcibly pulling on the reins, dragging his horse behind him. He waited for the shot with the same feeling that he would have had if the bullet were intended for his own back. He waited for the shot, and his heart counted out every second. But when behind him there was a sharp sudden crack, his knees sagged under him, and he was hardly able to restrain his rearing horse. For a couple of hours they rode without speaking. When they halted, Chumakov was the first to break the silence. Covering his eyes with his palm, he said huskily, What the devil did I shoot him for? We ought to have left him behind in the steppe and not put an unnecessary sin on my soul. I can see him now before my eyes. 
Can't you ever get used to it? Fomin asked. With all the men you've killed, you still can't get used to it? You haven't got a heart, you've got rusty iron. Chumakov paled and stared furiously at Fomin. Don't you get across me just now, Yakov Yefimich, he said quietly. Don't you peck at me, for I can put even you out, and very easily, too. What the devil do I need to get across you for? I've got enough worry without you, Fomin said in a conciliatory tone, and lay on his back, screwing up his eyes against the sunlight, contentedly stretching himself. Chapter 7 Contrary to Grigor's expectations, during the next ten days over forty Cossacks joined up with Fomin. They were the remnants of various small bands which had been broken up by Soviet forces. They had lost their leaders and were wandering aimlessly about the region, and they gladly served under Fomin. They were completely unconcerned as to whom they served and whom they killed, so long as they were able to live their free, nomad life and plunder all who fell into their hand. They were a lot of desperados, and Fomin remarked contemptuously to Grigor as he looked at them, Well, Melyakov, it's the riffraff that has joined us, not men. Gallows birds, they look as though specially picked for the rope. In his heart of hearts, Fomin still regarded himself as a fighter for the toiling people, and though not so frequently as in the past, he would still say, We're the liberators of the Cossackry. He stubbornly refused to abandon the most absurd of hopes. He again began to wink at the pillaging committed by his companions in arms, taking the view that it was all a necessary evil to which he must be reconciled, that as time passed he would free himself of the looters, and that sooner or later he would be a genuine commander of insurgent forces and not the ottoman of a miserable little band of brigands. But Chumakov did not hesitate to call all the Fomin men brigands, and argued until he was hoarse, trying to convince Fomin that he also was nothing but a brigand on a large scale. When they were alone, furious arguments frequently broke out between them. I'm an idealistic fighter against the Soviet regime, Fomin would shout, turning livid with anger. And you call me the devil knows what. Do you understand, you fool, that I'm fighting for an ideal? Don't try to pull my leg, Chumakov objected. Don't try to pull the wool over my eyes. I'm not a child. A fine idealist you are. You're a born brigand and nothing more. And why are you so afraid of the word? I don't understand that at all. Why do you insult me like that, you foul-mouthed scum? I rose against the government and I'm fighting against it with weapons. So how am I a brigand? That's exactly why you are a brigand, because you're fighting against the government. Brigands have always been against the government ever since the beginning of time. No matter what the Soviet government may be, it's the government. It's held on ever since 1917, and anyone who works against it is a brigand. You empty pate. And how about General Krasnov or Denikin? Were they brigands too? Well, what else were they? They were brigands, only they wore epaulets. And the epaulets don't matter much. You and I can put them on. Fomin banged his fist, spat, and, unable to think of any convincing arguments, cut short the useless dispute. It was impossible to persuade Chumakov of anything. The majority of those who joined the band were excellently armed and dressed. Almost all of them had good horses, accustomed to endless marches and easily covering sixty miles a day. Some of them even had two horses, one to ride and the other to lead at the side. When necessary, by changing from horse to horse, allowing each to rest in turn, a rider with two mounts could cover some hundred and twenty miles a day. One day, Fomin remarked to Grigor, If we'd each had two horses at the beginning, no devils on earth could have caught us. The militia and Red Army forces mustn't take horses from the people, and they're not willing to do it. But we can do what we like. We must provide every man with a spare mount, and then they'll never catch us. Old folk used to say that in former days that's how the Tatars made their raid, each with two horses, and sometimes even with three. Who could catch such riders? And we must do the same. That Tatar wisdom is greatly to my fancy. They quickly got hold of more horses, and for a time they did in fact become uncatchable. 
The mounted militia, which had been newly organized in Vyshenska, vainly tried to overtake them. The spare horses made it possible for Fomin's numerically small force to throw off the enemy without difficulty, and to get several marches ahead of him, so avoiding any dangerous clash. Nonetheless, in the middle of May, a force almost four times as large as the band succeeded in pinning it down against the Don, not far from Bobrovsky in ust district. But after a brief fight, the band broke through and retired along the bank of the river, losing eight men killed and wounded. Shortly after this engagement, Fomin asked Grigor to take over the position of chief of staff. We need someone educated so that we can move according to a plan, by a map, or someday they'll squeeze us and shake us up again. You take over the job, Grigor Pantelievich. You don't need a staff to catch militiamen and cut their heads off, Grigor said moodily. Every detachment ought to have its staff. Don't talk nonsense. Give Chumakov the post if you can't live without a staff. But why don't you want to take it on? I've got no idea of what it means. And has Chumakov? No, Chumakov hasn't either. Then what the hell are you suggesting him for? You're an officer, and you ought to have some idea of it. You ought to know all about tactics and that sort of thing. I was about as good an officer as you are a detachment commander. And there is only one tactic for us, to roam about the steppe and keep our eyes skinned, Grigor said sarcastically. Fomin winked at Grigor and threatened him with his forefinger. I can see right through you, always keeping yourself in the shade. You want to keep out of the light? That won't save you, brother. It's all the same whether you're a troop commander or chief of staff. You don't think they'll give you any discount if they catch you. You wait and see. I'm not thinking of that at all. You're on the wrong track, Grigor said, fixedly examining the sword knot on his saber hilt. But I don't want to take on a task I know nothing about. Well, if you don't want to, you needn't. We'll manage somehow without you, the incensed Fomin agreed. The situation was completely changing in the region. The gates of the prosperous Cossacks, who formerly had welcomed Fomin with great hospitality, were now bolted against him. And when the band arrived in a village, the masters hurriedly scattered and hid in the orchards and gardens. The itinerant session of the Revolutionary Tribunal, which had arrived at Vyshenska, sternly punished many Cossacks who in the past had made Fomin welcome. The news of the sentences sped through the districts and had corresponding influence on the minds of those who had openly expressed their friendliness towards the bandits. In the course of a fortnight, Fomin made an extensive ride through all the districts of the Upper Dawn. The band now numbered some 130 sabers, and it was being pursued not by a hurriedly mustered mounted group, but by several squadrons of the 13th Cavalry Regiment, which had been transferred from the southern front. Many of those who had recently attached themselves to Fomin were natives of distant parts. They had found their way to the dawn by devious roads. Some of them had escaped singly from prison gangs, from prisons and prison camps. But the majority consisted of a group of several dozen horsemen who had broken away from Maslak, and also remnants of the shattered Kurochkin band. The Maslak men willingly allowed themselves to be separated and dispersed into the various troops. But the Kurochkin men did not wish to be broken up. They formed an entire separate troop, strongly welded together and holding themselves somewhat apart from the other members of the band. In battle or in bivouac, they acted as a single group. They hung about together, and when they had pillaged some cooperative shop or warehouse, they poured everything into the common troop cauldron and shared out the loot equally, strictly observing the principles of equality. Several Tyriek and Kuban Cossacks in ragged Circassian coats, two Kalmyks, a Latvian in hunting boots reaching to his thighs, and five sailor anarchists in striped jerseys and faded sailor's kit still more varied the already motley heterogeneous composition of the Fomin band. Well, you still argue that you aren't in command of brigands? But what do you call these? Fighters for ideals? Chumakov asked Fomin one day, indicating the extended marching column with his eyes. We only want an unfrocked priest and a few swine in trousers, and then we'd have a complete collection of the blessed saints. 
Fomin ignored the remark. His sole anxiety was to gather around him as many men as possible. He took nothing into account when he accepted volunteers. He himself questioned every man who expressed a wish to serve under his command and said curtly, You're good for service, I'll take you. Go to my chief of staff, Chumakov. He'll assign you to a troop and give you weapons. In one of the villages of Migulinsk district, a well-dressed, curly-headed, swarthy youngster was brought to Fomin. He announced his desire to join the band. On questioning him, Fomin learned that he was a native of Rostov and had recently been sentenced for armed robbery, but had escaped from the Rostov prison and hearing of Fomin had made his way to the Upper Dawn area. What are you by race, an Armenian or Bulgarian? Fomin asked him. I'm a Jew, the lad answered in some embarrassment. Fomin was dumbfounded at this surprising avowal and was silent for some time. He did not know what to do in such an unexpected situation. After racking his brains, he sighed deeply and said, Well, if you're a Jew, you're a Jew. We don't look down our noses even at such. It means one more man. But can you ride a horse? No? You'll learn. We'll give you some quiet little mare to start with, and then you'll learn. Go to Chumakov. He'll assign you to your troop. A few minutes later, the infuriated Chumakov galloped up to Fomin. Are you mad or are you joking? he shouted, reining his horse onto its hind legs. What the devil have you sent me a Jew for? I won't accept him. Let him go to the four corners of the earth. Take him, take him, it'll make one more, Fomin said calmly. But Chumakov foamed at the mouth and roared, I won't, I'll kill him, but I won't take him. The Cossacks are kicking up a row about it. You go and talk to them yourself. While they were arguing and cursing each other, the Cossacks had got hold of the young Jew by one of the baggage wagons and were stripping him of his embroidered shirt and cloth trousers. As he tried the shirt against himself, one of the Cossacks said, Do you see that old bush out there beyond the village? Run to it at a trot and lie down. You'll lie there until we leave here, and when we've gone, you can get up and go wherever you like. Don't come near us any more, or we'll kill you. You'd better go back to Rostov, to your mammy. It isn't your Jewish job to fight. The Lord God taught you to trade, not to fight. We can manage and tackle that job without you. The Jew was not accepted. But on the other hand, that very same day, the Cossacks caught the half-wit Pasha, known in all the villages of the Vyshenska district, and roaring with laughter assigned him to the second troop. He was captured in the steppe, brought to the village, and solemnly arrayed in a uniform taken from a dead Red Army man. The Cossack showed him how to handle a rifle and spent much time teaching him how to wield a saber. Gregor was on his way to his horse at the hitching post, but seeing a dense crowd, he turned aside to find out what was happening. A roar of laughter caused him to hasten his steps, and then in the abrupt silence he heard someone's sober, monitorial voice. No, not like that, Pasha. Whoever uses his saber like that? You can chop wood that way, but not a man. You must do it like this, do you see? When you catch him, order him at once to go down on his knees, for you'll find it awkward to saber him when he's standing up. He goes down on his knees, and you come up like this behind him and slash at his neck. Try not to cut him straight down, but so the blade makes a slanting cut. Surrounded by bandits, the half-wit stood at attention, firmly clutching the hilt of his bared saber. Smiling and beatifically screwing up his gray eyes, he listened to the instructions being given him by one of the Cossacks. The corners of his mouth were dribbling like a horse's with frothy bits of food. Spittle was flowing copiously over his coppery red beard onto his chest. He licked his dirty lips and said in a tongue-tied lisp, I get it all, my boy. Is this right? I make the slave of God go down on his knees, and I cut through his neck, right through. You've given me trousers and a shirt and boots, only I haven't got a coat. You might give me one little coat, and then I'll please you. I'll try with all my might. You kill some commissar, and then you'll have a coat. But you might tell us how you got married last year, one of the Cossacks suggested. A look of elemental fear flickered through the half-wit's dilated, filmy eyes. 
he uttered a string of curses and, to the accompaniment of a roar of laughter, began to tell some story. So loathsome was the scene that Gregor shuddered and hurriedly turned away. And it's with these men that I've linked my fate, he thought, possessed by feelings of bitterness and anger within himself, with all this hateful life. He lay down by the hitching posts, trying to close his ears to the idiot's shouts and the Cossack's thunderous laughter. I'll clear out tomorrow. It's about time, he decided, looking at his well-fed horses and noting their splendid condition. He had taken documents in the name of Ushakov, off a dead militiaman, and had sewn them in the lining of his greatcoat. For some two weeks he had been preparing his horses for a short but swift gallop. He watered them at regular times, curried them more diligently than he had ever curried his army mounts, by all legal and illegal means obtained grain for them at night, and his horses looked in better condition than any of the others. Especially his Ukrainian dapple gray horse, its coat shone all over, and its hair glittered in the sun like Caucasian yellow silver. With such horses he could be sure of drawing away from any pursuit. He rose and went to a nearby hut. He respectfully asked an old woman who was sitting on the threshold of the granary, Have you got a scythe, Granny? We did have one somewhere, but the Lord knows where it is. What do you want it for? I want to cut some green feed in your garden for my horses, may I? The old woman reflected and said, When will you get off our necks? It's nothing but give me this and give me that. One lot comes and demands grain... Another lot arrives and drags and carts off all they set their eyes on. I won't give you the scythe. Please yourself, but I won't give you it. Why, can't you spare the grass, godly old woman? Do you think more grass is going to grow on the bare spots? What am I to feed the cow on? Isn't there any grass in the steppe? Well, then go out into the steppe and cut it, my eagle. There's plenty out in the steppe, Gregor said irritably. You'd better let me have the scythe, Granny. I'll cut a little grass, and you'll have the rest. But if we turn our horses into your garden, we'll have the lot. The old woman looked harshly at Gregor and turned away. Go and get it yourself, she said. It ought to be hanging in the shed. Gregor found an old, broken scythe in the shed. As he passed the old woman, he distinctly heard her declare, There's no salvation from you, damn you. That was something to which he would never get accustomed. He had long known the Cossacks' attitude towards the band, and their right, too, he thought, as he carefully swung the scythe, trying to mow the grass cleanly, leaving no edges standing. What the devil do they want us for? Nobody needs us. We're preventing everybody from living and working in peace. A stop must be put to this, and about time, too. Occupied with his thoughts, he stood by his horses, watching them avidly seizing tufts of the tender young grass between their black, velvety lips. He was aroused from his meditation by a deep, youthful voice, which was obviously on the point of breaking. But what a fine horse! He's a real swan! Gregor looked in the direction of the speaker. A young Cossack, who had only recently joined the band, was staring at Gregor's gray horse and rapturously shaking his head. With his fascinated gaze fixed on the animal, he walked round it more than once, clicking his tongue. Is he your horse? he asked. Why, what do you want to know for? Gregor answered ungraciously. Let's swap. I've got a bay of pure Don blood. He can take any obstacle, and he's spirited. You wouldn't believe how spirited he is. He's like lightning. Go to the devil, Gregor said coldly. The youngster was silent for a moment or two, then sighed bitterly, and sat down not far off. He stared at the gray for a long time, then remarked, You know he's got the heaves. Gregor silently picked at his teeth with a straw. He was beginning to like this artless youngster. Won't you swap, Daddy? the lad asked quietly, looking at Gregor with pleading eyes. No, I won't. I wouldn't even if you threw yourself in with your horse. But where did you get it? I invented it myself. Oh, come on, tell the truth. It came through the usual gates. A mare dropped it. It's no use talking to such a fool, the lad said in an offended tone and went off. Empty as though dead, the village lay before Gregor. 
Except for Fomin's men, there was not a soul in sight. A wagon abandoned in a lane, a chopping block in a yard with an axe hastily driven into it, and a half-planed board nearby. Haltered bullocks lazily cropping the stunted grass in the middle of the street. An overturned bucket by the well shaft. All these things testified that the peaceful life of the village had been unexpectedly violated, and that the villagers had left their tasks unfinished and had gone into hiding. Grigor had seen a similar desolation and similar signs of hurried flight when the Cossack regiments had ridden through East Prussia. Now he had lived to see these things in his own country. With the same morose and hateful glances had he been welcomed then by the Germans and now by the Cossacks of the Upper Dawn. He recalled his talk with the old woman and mournfully looked about him, unbuttoning the collar of his shirt. That accursed pain was again attacking his heart. The sun was burning the earth. About the lane hung the vapid scent of dust, of goose grass and horse sweat. In the orchards, on the lofty willows, with their sprinkling of ragged nests, the rooks were croaking. A little step stream, fed by springs somewhere at the top of a ravine, slowly flowed through the village, dividing it into two parts. On both sides, the spacious Cossack yards crawled down to the water, smothered in a dense growth of gardens, with cherry trees spreading over the windows of the huts, apple trees with stout branches stretching their green foliage, and young bunches of fruit to the sun. With misty eyes, Grigor looked at the yard overgrown with ragged plantain, at the hut with yellow shutters and roofed with straw thatch, at the lofty well crane. By the threshing floor, on one of the posts of the old wattle fence, hung a horse's skull, bleached with rains. The holes of its empty eye sockets were yawning black. A green pumpkin plant entwined the same post, winding in a spiral, reaching up to the light. It had climbed to the top of the post and was clinging with its little tendrils to the teeth and the protuberances of the horse's skull. Its free end, in search of support, was already extending to a branch of a gelder rose bush standing not far off. Had he seen all this before in a dream or in his distant childhood? Gripped by a sudden attack of passionate yearning, he lay chest downward under the fence, covered his face with his palms, and got up only when the distant, long-drawn-out shout to horse reached his ears. That night, during the march, he rode out of the ranks, halted as though to change saddles from one horse to the other, and stood listening to the slowly distancing, dying clatter of horse hoofs. Then, springing into the saddle, he galloped off at right angles to the road. For three miles he urged on his horses without pause, then slowed down to a walking pace and listened. Was there any sound of pursuit behind him? All was quiet in the steppe. Only snipe were calling one to another on sandy spits, and somewhere very, very far off, a dog's baying was faintly to be heard. In the somber sky was a golden sprinkle of twinkling stars. Over the steppe was silence and a breeze laden with the native and bitter scent of wormwood. Grigor rose in his saddle and with all his lungs drew in a deep breath of relief. Chapter 8 Long before dawn, he galloped into the meadow which stretches before Tatarsk. Below the village, where the dawn was shallower, he stripped, tied his clothes, boots, and weapons to his horse's heads, and holding his wallet of cartridges in his teeth, set out with the animals to swim the river. The water scorched him with its unbearable cold. In the attempt to keep warm, he paddled swiftly with his right arm, holding the reins tied together in his left hand, quietly encouraging the grunting and snorting horses. On the bank he hurriedly dressed, tightened the saddle girths, and to warm the horses galloped swiftly towards the village. His wet greatcoat, the wet flaps of the saddle, his moist shirt all chilled his body. His teeth chattered, a shiver ran down his back, and he trembled all over. But soon the swift ride warmed him, and not far from the village he dropped into a walk, 
looking around him and listening intently. He decided to leave the horses in a gully. He dropped down to the bottom of the gully over the loose, stony rubble of the slope. The stones clattered dryly under the horses' hoofs, and fiery sparks were struck out by their shoes. He tied the animals to a withered elm he had known ever since his childhood and walked to the village. And there was the old Melyukov hut, the dark cluster of apple trees, the well crane pointing to the great bear. Panting with agitation, he dropped down to the river, cautiously crawled through the wattle fence of the Astakhov's yard, and went up to the unshuttered window. He could hear only the hurried beating of his heart and the muffled roaring of the blood in his head. He knocked quietly on the window frame, so quietly that he himself hardly heard the sound. Oxenia silently came to the window and looked out. He saw her press her hands to her breast and heard a faint groan burst from her lips. He signed to her to open the window and removed his rifle from his shoulder. She threw the window wide open. Quieter. How are you? Don't open the door. I'll come through the window, he whispered. He stood on the ledge of the house wall. Her bare arms caught him around the neck. They trembled and quivered against his shoulders so much did those dear, precious arms that their trembling was communicated to him. Xenia, wait, take the rifle, he stammered, whispering almost inaudibly. He wanted to embrace her, but she dropped heavily on her knees before him, put her arms around his legs, and pressed her face to his wet greatcoat. All her body shook with suppressed sobs. He lifted her, seated her on the bench, Leaning against him, hiding her face on his chest, she was silent, shuddering again and again, and with her teeth biting the lapel of his greatcoat to stifle her sobbing and to avoid wakening the children. Evidently she also, strong as she was, had been broken with suffering. Evidently her life also had been bitter during these past months. He stroked the hair fallen about her back, stroked her burning brow, wet with sweat, he let her weep her fill, then asked, Are the children alive and well? Yes. And Dunya? Dunya, too. Alive and well. Is Mikhail at home? But wait a bit. Do stop crying. My shirt's all wet with your tears. Xenia, my darling, that's enough. There's no time for tears. Time's short. Is Mikhail at home? Aksenia wiped her face and pressed Grigor's cheeks with her wet palms. Smiling through her tears, not removing her eyes from her beloved, she said quietly, I won't any more. I shan't cry any more. Mikhail's not in Tatarsk. He's been at Vyeshenska for the past two months, serving in some military force. Come and look at the children. Oh, we weren't expecting you, and we never hoped. Mishatka and Polyushka were sleeping on the bed, their arms and legs flung out. Grigor bent over them, stood thus for a moment or two, then tiptoed away and sat down silently beside Aksinya. "'How are you?' she asked in a burning whisper. "'How did you get here? And where have you been all this time? But supposing they catch you? I've come to fetch you. I don't think they'll catch me. Will you come? Where to? With me. I've left the band. I was with Fomin, did you hear? Yes, but where can I go with you? To the south, to the Kuban, or farther.' We'll manage to live and get our food somehow or other. I shan't be ashamed to do any work. My hands are in need of work and not of fighting. My soul has fallen sick during these past months. But we'll talk about that later. How about the children? We'll leave them with Dunya. Then we'll see later on. Later we'll take them too. Well, will you come? Grisha, my dearest Grisha. None of that. No tears. That's enough. We can cry later. There'll be plenty of time for that. Get yourself ready. I've got horses waiting in a gully. Well, will you come? Why, what did you think? She suddenly said aloud, and fearfully pressed her hand to her lips and glanced at the children. What did you think? She asked again in a whisper. Is my life so sweet alone by myself? I'll go, Grisha, my darling. I'll go on foot. I'll crawl after you, but I won't stay here alone any longer. I can't live without you. Kill me, but don't leave me again. She pressed herself passionately against him. He kissed her and glanced covertly at the window. Summer nights are short. They must hurry. 
Perhaps you'd like to lie down for a while, Oxenia asked. What are you thinking of? he exclaimed in alarm. It'll be dawn soon. We must be getting off. Dress and go and call Dunya. We'll talk it over with her. We must get to Suhoi Dial in the dark. We'll spend the day in the wood and move on at night. Can you ride a horse? Lord, I'll manage anyhow, and gladly on horseback. All the time I'm wondering whether I'm dreaming at all. I often see you in my dreams, and every time different. She hurriedly combed her hair, holding the hairpins in her teeth, and spoke so quietly as to be unintelligible. She swiftly dressed and went to the door. Shall I wake the children up, she asked. You could take a look at them. No, don't bother, Gregor said resolutely. He took his pouch out of his cap and began to roll a cigarette. But as soon as Oxenia had gone, he hurriedly went across to the bed and kissed the children with long kisses. Then he remembered Natalia and much else in his ill-starred life and burst into tears. As she crossed the threshold, Dunya said, Well, greetings, brother, so you've come home. No matter how much you roam about the steppe, and she broke into lamentations. The children have lived to see their father. They've been made orphans with their father still alive. Gregor embraced her and said sternly, Quieter, you'll wake the children up. Drop all that, sister. I've heard it all before. I've got enough tears and sorrow of my own. I didn't send for you to hear this. Will you take the children and look after them? But where are you going? I'm clearing out and taking Oxenia with me. Will you look after the children? I'll get work, and then I'll have them. Why, what else should I do? If you're both going, of course I'll take them. They can't be left in the street, and you can't throw them on the mercy of strangers. Gregor silently kissed her and said, My great thanks to you, sister. I knew you wouldn't refuse. She sat down on the chest and asked, When are you going at once? Yes. But how about the house and the farm? Oxenia answered irresolutely, You do what you like. Let someone live in it or do whatever you can. What is left of the clothing and property you have for yourself. What shall I tell people? They'll ask where you've gone, and what shall I tell them? Dunya asked. Say you don't know anything, that's all, Gregor said, and turned to Oxenia. Xenia, hurry. Don't take much with you. Just a warm jacket, two or three skirts, whatever linen you can, and food for immediate needs, that's all. The dawn was just beginning to spurt when, after saying goodbye to Dunya and kissing the still sleeping children, Gregor and Oxenia went out on the porch. They dropped down to the dawn and made their way along the bank to the gully. You and I once went off to Yagodnaya just like this, Gregor said. Only you had a larger bundle that time, and we ourselves were younger. Rapturous with joy, Oxenia glanced sidelong at him and answered, but all the time I'm afraid I shall find I've been dreaming. Give me your hand. Let me touch it, or I shan't believe it. She laughed quietly, pressing against his shoulder as she went. He saw her eyes swollen with tears and shining with happiness, her cheeks pale in the gloom of the early morning. He smiled indulgently and thought, She got herself ready and came as though going on a visit. Nothing frightens her. She's a great lass. As though in answer to his thoughts, she said, You see the sort of woman I am? You whistled as though to a dog, and I ran after you. My love and yearning for you, Grisha, have bound me so firmly. I'm only sorry for the children, but I wouldn't say one O oh over myself. I'll follow you everywhere, even to death. Hearing their footsteps, the horses quietly whinnied. Dawn was coming on impetuously. Already a narrow strip of heaven in the eastern confines was perceptibly rosy. A mist was rising above the waters of the dawn. Gregor untied the horses and helped Oxenia into the saddle. The stirrup straps were rather long for her legs. Angry at his own lack of foresight, he shortened the straps, then mounted the second horse. Keep up behind me, Xenia. When we get out of the gully, we'll ride at a gallop. That won't shake you up so much. Don't slacken the reins. The horse you're riding doesn't like it. And mind your knees. He's playful at times and tries to snap at your knees with his teeth. Well, off we go. It was some five miles to Suhoi Dell. They had soon covered the distance and were close to the woods by sunrise. On the fringe, Gregor dismounted and helped Oxenia off her horse. 
Well, how did you find it? Riding horseback is hard when you're not used to it, he said with a smile. Crimson with the gallop, Oxenia flashed her black eyes at him. It's fine, better than going on foot. Only my legs, she smiled with embarrassment. You turn round, Grisha, and I'll have a look. Something's pinching the skin. It must have got chafed. That's nothing. That'll pass off, he reassured her. Walk about a bit, for your legs are trembling a little. He screwed up his eyes and said in a bantering tone, Ah, you Cossack lass. At the very head of the dell, he found a small glade and said, This will be our camp. Make yourself at home, Xenia. He unsaddled the horses, hobbled them, and laid the saddles and his weapons under a bush. A copious heavy dew lay on the grass, and beneath the dew the grass seemed dove gray. But on the slope, where an early morning gloom still lurked, it gleamed a dull azure. Orange bumblebees were dozing in the half-opened chalices of the flowers. Skylarks were ringing above the step. In the grain, in the aromatic steppe grasses, the quails were calling, Time for bed, time for bed. Close to an oak sapling, Grigor crushed down the grass and stretched himself out with his head on a saddle. The thunderous tattoo of the quail's struggles, the stupefying song of the skylarks, and the warm wind floating from beyond the dawn, from sands which had burned with heat all night, all disposed him to sleep. Others could do as they liked, but for Grigor, who had not slept for several nights in succession, it was time for sleep. The quails convinced him, and overcome with sleep, he closed his eyes. Oxenia sat down beside him and was silent, thoughtfully plucking the violet petals of a flower with her lips. Grisha, you don't think anyone will catch us here? she quietly asked, touching Grigor's scrubby cheeks with the flower stalk. He aroused himself with difficulty from his drowsy oblivion and said hoarsely, There's nobody out in the step. It's the slack season now. I'll have a sleep, Ksenia, and you watch the horses. Then you can sleep. I'm worn out with lack of sleep. It's four days since... We'll talk afterwards. Sleep, my darling. Sleep well. She bent over him, gently brushed a strand of hair from his brow, and quietly touched his cheek with her lips. My dear Grisha, darling, the gray hairs you've got, she whispered, so you're growing old, and yet it's not so long ago that you were a boy. She looked with a faint, mournful smile into his face. He slept, his mouth open a little, breathing regularly. His black lashes, with ends bleached by sunlight, quivered very gently. His upper lip stirred, laying bare his firmly clenched white teeth. She looked at him more closely, and only then noticed how much he had changed during the past few months of their separation. There was a harsh, almost cruel expression in the deep vertical furrows between her beloved's brows, in the folds of his mouth, in the prominent cheekbones. And for the first time it occurred to her that he must be terrible in a battle, on a horse, with bared saber. The Dawn Flows Home to the Sea, Part 2, by Mikhail Sholokhov, concluded. And for the first time it occurred to her that he must be terrible in a battle, on a horse, with bared saber. Lowering her eyes, she glanced at his large, angular hands and sighed for some reason. After a while, she quietly rose and crossed the glade, holding her skirt high above the dewy grass to keep it from getting wet. Somewhere not far off, a little stream was purling and tinkling over stones. She dropped down to the watercourse, which was lined with flat, pale green, mossy stones, drank of the cold spring water, washed, and rubbed her crimson face dry with her handkerchief. On her lips was an unfading, quiet smile. Her eyes glittered joyously. Grigor was with her again. Once more, the unknown was beckoning her to a transparent happiness. Many tears had Oxenia shed during sleepless nights. Many sorrows had she borne during the past few months. Only yesterday she had been in the garden, 
and women hoeing potatoes in neighboring patches had begun to sing a mournful song. Her heart had constricted painfully and involuntarily. She had listened. Tiga, tiga, gray geese, home you fly. Surely it's time you came and had a swim. Surely it's time you came and had a swim while I, a woman, sit down and have a cry. So a woman's soprano voice sang, complaining of her accursed lot, and Oxenia lost her self-control. The tears spurted from her eyes. She tried to find oblivion in work, to stifle the longing which stirred about her heart, but her tears misted her eyes, dropped on the green leaves of the potato plants, on her helpless hands, and she saw nothing and could not work. She threw down the hoe and lay on the ground, hiding her face in her hands, giving rain to her tears. Only yesterday she had been cursing her life, and everything around her had seemed as gray and joyless as a cloudy day. But today the world seemed exultant and bright, as though after a plentiful summer downpour. We too will find our life, she thought, abstractedly looking at the fretted oak leaves flaming beneath the slanting rays of the rising sun. Scented, varicolored flowers were growing close to the bushes, and in the patches of sunlight. Oxenia picked a great armful of them, carefully seated herself not far from Gregor, and remembering her youth began to fashion a garland. The result proved to be decorative and beautiful. She sat admiring it, then thrust several rosy flowers of eglantine into it, and laid it at Gregor's head. About nine o'clock, Gregor was awakened by the neighing of the horses, and sat up in alarm, groping around him for his weapons. There's nobody here, Oxenia said quietly. What are you afraid of? He rubbed his eyes and smiled sleepily. I've learned to live like a hare. You sleep, and even in your sleep you peep with one eye and tremble at every sound. It takes a long time to get out of that habit, girl. Have I been asleep long? No. Would you like to sleep longer? I ought to sleep the clock round in order to get all the rest I need. We'd better have breakfast. I've got bread and a knife in my saddlebags. You get them, and I'll go and water the horses. He rose, took off his greatcoat, and wriggled his shoulders. The sun was scorching now. A wind rustled the leaves of the trees, and through their rustling the singing chatter of the stream was no longer audible. He went down to the water, made a little dam of stones and twigs, then with his saber dug up earth and packed it into the openings between the stones. When the water gathered behind his dam, he led the horses down and let them drink, then removed their bits and turned them loose to graze again. At breakfast, Oxenia said, Where shall we be going from here? To Marazovsky. We'll ride as far as Platov, and then we'll go on on foot. How about the horses? We'll leave them somewhere. That's a pity, Gregor. They're such good horses. You simply couldn't get tired of looking at that gray. And we've got to leave him behind? Where did you get hold of him? Get hold of him, Viegor smiled cheerlessly. I looted him from a Ukrainian. After a bitter silence, he said, Pity or not, we've got to leave them behind. It's not for us to trade in horses. But what are you riding with a rifle for? What good is it to you? God grant nobody sees it, for it'll bring woe upon us. Who's going to see us at night? I kept it just in case. I feel lost without it. When we leave the horses, I'll leave the rifle behind, too. It won't be needed after that. After breakfast, they lay down on his great coat. He vainly fought against his sleepiness, while Oxenia, resting on one elbow, told him the life she had lived without him, and how much she had suffered during the past months. He heard her level voice through his invincible doze, and had no strength to open his heavy eyelids. At times he completely ceased to hear her. Her voice receded into the distance, sounded fainter, and died away entirely. He shuddered and awoke, but in a few minutes he again closed his eyes. His weariness was greater than his desire and will. They used to long for you and ask, Where's father? I did what I could with them, and almost always I was kind to them. They got used to me and quite attached to me, and didn't visit Dunya so often. Polyushka's quiet and gentle. I made her dolls out of scraps of material, and she sat with them under the table, busying herself with them. 
But once Mishatka ran in from the street, trembling all over. What's the matter, I asked him. He burst into tears, and such bitter tears. The other boys won't play with me. They say my daddy's a bandit. Mummy, is it true he's a bandit? What are bandits? I told him, your daddy isn't a bandit at all. He's just unfortunate. But he pestered me with his questions. Why is he unfortunate, and what does unfortunate mean? I simply couldn't explain it to him. They themselves started to call me mother. Grisha, you mustn't think I taught them to. But Mikhail was quite good to them, quite kind. He would never speak to me. He turned his back or walked past. But more than once he brought sugar for them from Vyshenska. Prokhor was always grieving about you. There's a good man lost, he used to say. Last week he came and talked about you until his eyes streamed with tears. They made a search of my hut, looking for weapons under the eaves, in the cellar, everywhere. He fell asleep without hearing her story to the end. Above his head the leaves of a young elm rustled in the wind. Yellow gleams of light slipped across his face. Oxenia long kissed his closed eyes. Then she too fell asleep, her cheek pressed against Grigor's arm, smiling even in her sleep. They left Suhoi Dell late at night, when the moon had risen. After two hours riding, they dropped from a rise down to the Chira River. Corn crakes were calling in the meadowland. Frogs were straining their throats in the reedy backwaters of the river. And somewhere in the distance, a bittern boomed hollowly. Along the riverside extended a mass of orchards, forbiddingly somber in the mist. Not far from a little bridge, Grigor halted. A midnight silence wrapped the village. He touched up his horse with his heels and turned aside. He did not like riding across the bridge. He did not trust this silence and was afraid of it. On the outskirts of the village they forded the stream and had just turned into a narrow lane when a man rose from a ditch, three more behind him. Halt! Who goes there? Grigor started at the shout as though before a blow and pulled on the reins. At once mastering himself, he cried, Friends! And sharply turning his horse, managed to whisper to Oxenia, Back! Follow me! The four men of the outpost, set for the night by a grain requisitioning detachment, silently and unhurriedly came towards them. One halted to light a cigarette, striking a match. Grigor brought his whip hard down on Oxenia's horse. The animal reared and at once tore away in a gallop, Bending over his horse's neck, Grigor galloped after it. There was a silence which lasted for several oppressive seconds. Then an irregular rolling volley rang out, and spurts of fire pierced the darkness. Grigor heard the burning whistle of the bullets and a long, drawn-out shout, To arms! When some two hundred yards from the river, Grigor overtook the gray horse, which was moving at a long, sweeping gallop, and shouted to Oxenia as he drew level, Bend lower, Xenia! Bend lower! But she pulled on the reins, and throwing herself back, toppled sideways. Grigor managed to hold her, or she would have fallen. Are you wounded? Where have they hit you? Speak! he asked hoarsely. She was silent, and hung more and more heavily on his arm. Pressing her to himself as they galloped, he gasped and whispered, For God's sake, just a word! What's the matter with you? But neither word nor groan did he hear from the speechless Oxenia. Some two miles outside the village, he turned sharply off the road, made towards a ravine, dismounted, and lifted Oxenia off the horse, gently laying her on the ground. He removed her warm jacket, tore the thin cotton blouse and shirt at her breast, and groped for the wound. The bullet had entered her body through the left shoulder blade, shattering the bone, and emerging obliquely below the right collarbone. With blood-stained, trembling hands, he took his field dressing and a clean undershirt from his saddlebag. He raised Oxenia, put his knee behind her back, and began to bandage the wound, trying to stanch the blood spurting out below the collarbone. The pieces of shirt and bandage were swiftly darkened and soaked. Blood was even flowing from her half-open mouth and it burbled and gurgled in her throat. And going numb with horror, he realized that it was all over. 
that the most terrible thing that could happen in his life had already happened. Down the steep slope, down a little path trodden out in the grass and sprinkled with meadow saxifrage, he cautiously made his way into the ravine, carrying Oxenia in his arms. Her helplessly hanging head lay on his shoulder. He heard her whistling, sobbing breath, and felt the warm blood leaving her body and flowing out of her mouth onto his chest. The two horses followed him down into the ravine. Snorting, clanking their bits, they began to chew the juicy grass. She died in his arms a little before dawn. She did not recover consciousness. He silently kissed her on her lips, which were cold and salty with blood, carefully lowered her to the grass, and rose. Some unknown force struck him on the chest, and he fell, dropping on his back, but he at once jumped to his feet in terror. He fell yet again, painfully striking his bare head on a stone. Then, without rising from his knees, he drew his saber from its scabbard and began to dig a grave. The earth was damp and soft. He worked with great haste, but a choking feeling clutched his throat, and to breathe more easily he tore open the shirt at his neck. The early morning freshness chilled his sweaty breast, and then he found it not so hard to work. He dug out the earth with his hands and his saber, not resting a moment. But while he was digging a grave to the depth of his waist, much time passed. Grigor buried his Oxenia by the brilliant morning light. As she lay in the grave, he folded her deathly pale yet swarthy arms across her chest and covered her face with her kerchief so that the earth should not fill her glazing half-open eyes as they gazed immovably at the sky. Then he took his farewell of her, firmly believing that they would not be separated for long. With his palms he diligently pressed down the damp yellow clay over the mound, and remained long on his knees beside the grave, his head bowed, his body swaying a little. Now he had nothing to hurry for. Everything was finished. The sun rose above the ravine through the smoky haze of the burning wind from the east. Its rays silvered the mass of gray hair on Grigor's head and slipped over his pale and terribly immobile face. As though awakening from an oppressive sleep, he raised his head and saw above him the black sky and the blindingly glittering black disk of the sun. Chapter 9 in the early spring, when the snow vanishes and the grass which had been buried under it during the winter begins to dry, fires break out in the steppe. Flames driven by the wind fly along in streams, greedily consuming the dry foxtail grass, leaping over the lofty stalks of the thistle grass, slipping along the brown heads of the mugwort, spreading out in the hollows. And afterwards, the acrid, burning smell of charred and cracked earth hangs about the steppe. All around, the young grass is showing merrily green. Innumerable skylarks are fluttering in the azure heaven above. Migrant geese are feeding on the nourishing herbage. And the bustards are settling for the summer and building their nests. But wherever the steppe fires have passed, the dead, charred earth blackens ominously. No birds nest on it, the animals pass round it, and only the wind, winged and swift, flies across it, carrying the dove-gray ash and the dark, pungent dust far over the steppe. Like the steppe scorched with fires, Grigor's life also turned black. He had been deprived of everything which was dear to his heart. Pitiless death had taken everything from him, had destroyed everything. Only the children were left. But he himself still clung convulsively to the earth, as though his broken life was in very deed of some value to himself and others. After burying Oxenia, he wandered aimlessly about the steppe for three days. But he rode neither home nor to Vyshenska to make his act of submission. On the fourth day, abandoning the horses in one of the villages of the Ust-Hapirsk district, he crossed the Don and made his way on foot to the Slachevsky Oak Forest, on the fringe of which the Fomin Band had first been shattered in the previous April. 
Even then, in April, he had heard that deserters had settled in the forest, and to them he went, for he had no desire to return to Fomin. For several days he wandered about the enormous forest. He was tortured with hunger, but he could not bring himself to go to any human habitation. With the death of Oxenia, he had lost his native wit and his former daring. The snap of a breaking twig, a rustle in the dense forest, the cry of a night bird, all reduced him to terror and dismay. He lived on the unripe fruits of wild strawberries, tiny wild mushrooms, the leaves of hazel bushes, and grew terribly emaciated. At the close of the fifth day, deserters found him in the forest and took him to their dugout. There were seven of them. They were all inhabitants of local villages and had settled in the forest in the autumn of the previous year to avoid being mobilized. In their spacious dugout, they lived as comfortably as at home and had need of hardly anything. At night, they often went off to visit their families, bringing back rusks, millet, bread, flour, and potatoes. And they had no difficulty in obtaining meat for stewing from villages where they were not known by occasionally stealing a sheep. One of the deserters, who had served in the 12th Cossack Regiment, recognized Grigor, and they accepted him in their midst without any great wrangling. He lost count of the tormentingly endless days. He lived somehow or other in the forest until October, but when the autumn rains set in and then the cold weather, a longing for his children, for his native village, awoke with new and unexpected strength within him. To kill time, he sat for days on end on his plank bed, carving spoons out of wood, hollowing out dishes, dexterously fashioning toy figures of people and animals from soft stone. He tried not to think of anything and not to let the venomous longing find its way to his heart. During the daytime, he succeeded, but through the long winter nights, the yearning engendered of his memories overwhelmed him. He tossed long and long on the pallet and could not get to sleep. In the daytime, none of the other inhabitants of the dugout heard a word of complaint from him. But at night he frequently awoke, trembling and passing his hand over his face, found his cheeks and his dense six months' growth of beard wet with tears. He often dreamed of the children, of Oxenia, his mother, and all his other dear ones who were no longer among the living. All his life lay in the past, but the past seemed a brief and fretful sleep. Just to see the old spots once more, to feast my eyes on the children, and then I can die, he often thought. One day in the early spring, Chumakov unexpectedly turned up. He was wet to the waist and as cheery and fidgety as ever. After drying his clothes by the fire and getting warm, he sat down on the pallet beside Grigor. We've done a bit of wandering, Melyukov, since you left us. We've been almost to Astrakhan and in the Kalmyk steppe. We've traveled over the wide world, and the blood we've shed, there's no reckoning it. The Reds took Yakov Yefimovich's wife as a hostage and confiscated his property, but he went mad and gave orders that everybody who served the Soviet regime was to be killed, and we began to kill them all off, teachers and doctors and agricultural instructors. The devil knows whom we didn't kill. But now they've finished us and completely, he said, sighing and bristling still more with cold. We were shattered close to Tishanska the first time, and then again near Solyony a week ago. We were hemmed in on three sides at night. They left us only one way out up a hill, and there the snow was lying up to the horses' bellies. They opened fire with machine guns at dawn, and that was the beginning of the end. They mowed us all down with machine guns. Fomin's young son and I are the only two who escaped. He, Fomin, I mean, had taken his son Davidka about with him ever since autumn. Yakov Yefimovich himself was killed. I saw him killed with my own eyes. The first bullet hit him in the leg and smashed his kneecap. The second struck him a glancing blow on the head. Three times he fell from his horse. We stopped and picked him up and seated him in his saddle. But he would ride on a little way and then fall again. The third bullet got him. It hit him in the side. And then we had to leave him. 
When I galloped a little way, I looked back, and two horsemen were already slashing him with their sabers as he lay. Well, and that's how it was bound to be, Griego said unconcernedly. Chumakov spent the night in the dugout, and in the morning said goodbye. Where are you off to, Griegor asked. Smiling, Chumakov answered, To look for an easy life. Perhaps you'll come with me. No, you go off by yourself. You're right, I couldn't live with you. Your craft is carving cups and spoons, and that's not in my line, Chumakov said derisively. He took off his cap and bowed. God save you, peaceable brigands, for your hospitality and shelter. May God grant you a merry life, for you're having a boring time here. You live in the forest, and do you call that life? After Chumakov's departure, Grigor lived another week in the forest, then made ready to depart. Going home, one of the deserters asked him, and for the first time during all his stay in the dugout, Grigor smiled very faintly. Yes, going home. You should wait till spring. They'll give us an amnesty for May Day, and then we'll all go home. No, I can't wait, Grigor answered, and he said goodbye. Next morning he drew near to the dawn opposite Tatarsk. He stood gazing at his native yard, turning pale with the excitement of his joy. Then he slipped off his rifle, took out the shreds of hemp he used for cleaning it, and his little bottle of machine oil, and for some reason counted his cartridges. He had twelve clips and twenty-six loose bullets. Below the cliff the ice had retreated from the edge. The translucent green water was splashing and breaking away the needly ice along the bank. Grigor threw his rifle and pistol into the dawn, then poured his cartridges after them, and wiped his hands thoroughly on the edge of his greatcoat. Below the village he crossed the dawn over the blue, half-thawed, and pitted March ice, and went with long strides towards his hut. When he was still some distance away, he saw Mishatka on the slope leading down to the landing stage, and could hardly keep himself from running to the lad. Mishatka was breaking off the icicles hanging from a stone, throwing them down the slope, and watching fixedly as the blue fragments went rolling. Grigor went along to the slope and, panting, hoarsely, called his son. Mishenka, little son! Mishatka glanced at him in terror and dropped his eyes. He guessed that this bearded and terrible-looking man was his father. All the gentle and tender words which Grigor had whispered as night after night in the oak forest he recalled his children, now fled from his memory. Dropping down on his knees, kissing his son's rosy, cold little hands, in a choking voice he uttered only the words, Little son, little son. Then he took his son by the hand. Gazing greedily with dry, ecstatically burning eyes into the boy's face, he asked, How are you all? How's Auntie? Polyushka? Are they alive and well? Still not looking at his father, Mishatka quietly answered, Auntie Dunya's well, but Polyushka died in the autumn of diphtheria, and Uncle Mikhail's a soldier. And now that little thing of which Grigor had dreamed during so many sleepless nights had come to pass. He stood at the gate of his own home, holding his son by the hand. This was all life had left to him all that for a little longer gave him kinship with the earth and with the spacious world which lay glittering under the chilly sun. This concludes the reading of The Dawn Flows Home to the Sea, Part 2, by Mikhail Sholokhov. Your reader has been Wolfram Kandinsky.